And we are back with another episode of the Everyday Warrior Podcast. It's been a while. I've, I've Were been we ever away? I, I was. Uh, I think I was gone too. That's right. Oh, I know you guys have been standing in. I appreciate it. It's been uh, a few uh, great weeks. Just got back from Italy. Nice. With the wife. Where'd, uh, where'd you guys go? We went to uh, Sorrento, the uh, Amalfi Coast. Where do you mean uh, north, south, so east, west? Flew into uh, Naples. Okay. Which uh, we actually flew from Austin direct to uh, Frankfurt. Um, not a great airline. I'm not going to name the airline. L- L- Lufthansa. Oh, Luf- Fon- did, uh, Lufthansa. Lufthansa did not have a great experience. Uh-huh. And, and especially having you know flown across all continents, it was a worse flight than uh, any other flight we had had. Really? What was so bad about it? Uh, they, they messed up our tickets. Uh-huh. Like we had booked these things probably three months out. They switched our seats multiple times. I basically had a Karen moment. Oh. Uh-huh. In uh, Karen uh, Kelly or Ka- Karen, Karen and racial slur. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no, as in uh, what's the male Karen? Chad. It's Chad. Uh, is that what it is? Chad? It's yeah, a Chad. Chad. Okay. Well, I had a Chad moment. Um, <laughs> I, we, I always thought your real Chad was like a good looking dude. No, Chad's like dressed ridiculously, like really like uh, skin tight pants and loafers. Oh, and like hats? Fiores and, and like fedoras? fedoras, fedoras all right. All like right. That. So we're, we're, <laughs> first of all, <laughs> the, fact, the fact that you showed that to your wife, you know, you're not supposed to like show those text messages to your significant other. Oh. I like. I didn't know if that was like rule number one to be married. Like I tell my wife and she does not that she listens to this podcast. I'm like, everybody's the most amazing people. Everybody's just, like, like, it doesn't do There's a good rule of thumb. So she, she yeah. laughed. She laughed. Of course she loves you guys. That is a good rule of thumb yeah. is man or woman. You don't come home and bitch about your workplace to your significant other because they naturally become a toxic yeah. well with you inside with you. And they're, unless your, 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 your husband or spouse is just, extremely objective and they take it from that approach but sure. that's really the case but no no let's, let's go into this you know one um michelle <laughs> no, even no. young michelle Come on. has said hey mike you, you, you need it. to dress a little differently do it. uh jordan has constantly gotten upset that i'm jeans and t-shirts but of course when i go and do keynote speech, sure. speeches i'm in a blazer sure. or, or professional setting but she said hey let me we're, we're going to an italian wedding you it, can't wear a ball cap is your wife italian no but you're italian yes okay so, so who was who's getting married? Uh, so a buddy, okay. uh, I, I so old teammate. Okay, don't want to go into details because still uh, right. doing his thing. Um, which we never thought he was going to get married. This guy looks like Superman, uh-huh. built. Um, we we always thought he was going to be the permanent bachelor. So uh, good to f- see that he finally found his mate. Nice. Did it right. Got married in his uh, late thirties. Nice. Like I think he's thirty nine. Actually forty. Perfect. Uh, financially sound. Uh, brilliant dude. But anyway, she said, "Hey, listen." Let me take care of the dress. Hmm. So we went and uh, let's just say the tailor showed a lot of ankle and she <laughs> ended up getting toes or shoes that are, are pointed on the end mm-hmm. and um, a fedora because you can't wear a baseball cap and it was during the day. So mm-hmm. these guys sent some pretty and Sean started it. Sean's uh, going to get it. They attacked you. They did. <laughs> I've got actually pictures of if you want to pull up Sean's Instagram there's one of him and Tyson in, you know, those, those, uh, road biker outfits that are really skin tight. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, onesies. But here's the thing. They don't go on a 60 mile ride. They ride one mile to like sixth street and in those outfits, so they go into the bar. So it's just like, <laughs> <laughs> I'm probably going to uh, love it. That. I love it, dude. That's <laughs> those guys have a really Keep good sense down. of humor. Yeah, I know there's, there's two of them with their bicycles. It's, it's just embarrassing because everything is like uh, rolling, but, but- but, but are, are they doing it ironically? Yes. That, no, my guess not. is that they're no, doing it. No, they're doing ironically. it to be funny. Yeah, that's, and on that's top of I it, think. both of those guys have like gnarly cauliflower ears, which is like, you know, the uh, official uh, don't fuck with us. So yeah. it, it started a firestorm over text. And basically I said that you guys made my wife cry and she was going to murder you all. Uh, yeah. But she, she wasn't. She was laughing. And I get that's it. That's why I said. I, it guess. Was, I said it was tears of black. But I, I think you guys are in no <laughs> position to talk about dress. Um at all i don't think anyone here is 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 equipped to talk on fashion oh. in the men's room okay do you think is that uh, fair? I'm, I'm totally fine with that yeah yeah my days of uh high fashion are kind of behind I, I i think you know men really shouldn't be concerned with fashion that's why that's why we have jeans and t-shirts and that's why men have worn <laughs> jeans and i think it's their amazing. entire life i think it's amazing in those guys look at them such nerds just out of their element i love it yeah they, they have good sense of humor they do they're great guys that, that's ironic yeah i just think they're doing it but they're they're doing it you know there's a guys. sense of irony but if you actually they, look they those are have, real bikes yeah but i think they have uh they have like regular shoes on yeah, they got they, tennis shoes those are just tennis shoes so 
they don't have the clip in pedals then it has to be a, could you imagine because bikers good. bikers I, get pretty aggressive i do like that he's got a lululemon little fanny pack on yeah that's good look. they 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 make they, they bring the, the fanny pack back but um no hey congrats i know you uh recently had one of your uh, i don't want to say pupils yeah but one of your clients take uh well just one of my athletes um so this last weekend was bjj ibjjf worlds and victor hugo who's one of my athletes you know power mm -hmm. athlete and uh uh, Philippe Costa, they both competed. Um, Victor ended up winning double gold. So he won the open and the absolute, uh, got submissions in the open and the absolute final, which had only happened a few times in the history of the IBJJF. I think the last person to do it probably was like Shanji, his coach. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. then Shanji, obviously our other coach, um, first time that a former world champion has mentored another world champion to this level. And then v Victor also won, uh, the open and the weight division at, the. Uh, Brazilian nationals last month. So first time in history that somebody's won double gold Brazilian nationals and won the worlds. So he went out there and just absolutely smashed people into a million pieces. Conditioning wise, was he? Yeah. Um, there was a big match um, with a guy who had actually beat Victor before, who was a favorite and Victor just absolutely just decimated the dude to the point where they had pretty much like carried the dude off and he was laying on his back and they were having to ice his chest and Victor was standing right there just giving an interview. <laughs> So his conditioning was through the roof uh -huh. and he was just so much more physical. How old is he? Victor's 25. Yeah. So, I mean, his jujitsu is, uh, his brand of jujitsu, he moves like a little guy. He's so fluid. And now that we've just added the strength and the horsepower and the flexibility and the movement, I mean, within his hips, it's just, it's really almost unfair. And then the interesting thing was a lot of the guys, because it's drug tested, um, some of the guys that we'd seen at ADCC and before that were like real hulky, were all of a sudden not hulky. And Victor's just out there looking like a dump truck. Like it was so physically different to see him. And it's, you know, I mean, he just, and Philippe, um, he's a first year black belt. He's 23. He finished third in his first worlds and he finished second in pan. So like he did amazing too. And so I was just so excited for those kids. I mean, this was Philippe's really first experience lifting mm -hmm. weights. So I mean, mm -hmm. he's, he's only, they've only really been training for about eight months and to be this dominant, it was pretty Yeah, in, in my experience, the, the Brazilian side of, uh, jiu-jitsu world just isn't uh overly concerned with fitness you know it's like they don't they don't tend to have workout plans you know they yeah. like they do some calisthenics before class yeah and then they roll and that's it and and i i get that for you know, the, the best you know the most sport specific way to train your sport is to train your sport but you'd still need to be strong yeah. and agile and have a, have good cardiorespiratory cardiovascular yeah. training you know well, we would do, we, we ramped up their conditioning. I mean, I, I got them to the point of superhuman on the conditioning piece. They were rolling 14 times a week. Uh, then we'd get our training session. So just managing their volume. Um, and then when I got there, just making sure that they were ready, uh, what they needed and just getting them prepped. And, uh, the big thing too, as you know, obviously, you know, coaching and working with these athletes was like the mentor piece, um, explaining to them the magnitude of the moment and what they have to do to be the best. So um, as a NFL player, there were a few moments and I can think back at every single one where I stepped and I knew that, that this moment was like my moment to whether or not if I did what I was supposed to, it would alter the trajectory of my life. And I had this really amazing ability to realize like when it was happening, that I was in the moment and I knew what I needed to do. And I think a lot of guys I've met were like, fuck, like I, if only I had done this and they, like they, they can only see it after the fact. Mm -hmm. So being there with Victor and being like, dude, this is your chance to put a stamp to where you go to the hall of fame and you're the best to ever do this. And, um, seeing that kid realize it and then telling him like, remember, you're still a small town kid from Florida Lesa. That's going to fucking shock the world. And him yeah. being like, this is what we trained for. These are the hours we did it. And let's go out there and fucking murder these guys. And he did. He, um, uh, Eric Manis, who the guy he beat in the absolute final, he got him in this nasty double leg lock. I mean, to the point where he rolled over like a gator and like, we were like, oh, God, he's going to break both of his legs. And the dude just tapped instantly. So that was pretty – and 90 seconds into the final. So it was um, it, it was amazing to be there and to, like, have invested eight months of my life in training these guys and bringing them along to where, like, they had never lifted weights, teaching them to lift weights. And now all of a sudden they're out there and they're the best in the world was like, holy shit. So it was neat. And then, you know, Sean G, who's their coach, um, was extremely, you know uh, – just very thankful, but even to the point where, like, you know, the training didn't change, the jujitsu didn't change. The only change was we brought John on, and now here they are. So that was pretty right. big for us. And for power you know, athlete. I, I think for a lot of athletes, yes, the moment and, and the moment is sweet, but bad times cometh and bad times goeth. Good times come, yeah. good times goeth. It, the, the sign of a true champion is what they do afterwards. Yeah. And if they keep on going, if that's what they desire to do, but you know, um, 
in by no means am I assassinating Gordon Ryan, but it seems like he went a very different path post ADCC. Yeah, well, so um, you know, I mean, Gordon's probably the greatest no gi mm -hmm. grappler. I mean, mm -hmm. he's he's done some really amazing things, but um, he was a naturally a hundred and seventy five pound dude, and you know, ended up doing what he needed to be two hundred thirty five pounds. <laughs> really just pushed it, pushed the envelope. Um, and I think he's paying a little bit of the price for it. You Did know? you see the photos? Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know if I would have posted that. Yeah. I was, um, I questioned that. That's very bit. hard on your brand, uh, especially for somebody who's trying to, you know, obviously has an established brand and sponsors and that like, you know, and then the other issue, um, uh, like I know they're really forthcoming and honest with what they're doing and then being like, well, it's not illegal because they don't test. No, it is still legal. Uh, as baseball, as professional football, that's how you get run up in front of a Senate oversight committee where all of a sudden, you know, you're out there, you know, obviously performance enhancing for your sport, not for health or, you know, HRT type stuff. So I, I just am a little confused um, as a former NFL player and seeing this whole thing and remembering the baseball and the Balco <laughs> and all of this stuff go like, yeah, yeah, yeah but, those, but, but those were, yeah. those were banned by major league baseball in the nfl is, is is the league that he rolls in do they actually ban it or, or i mean are they no so so a, yeah. so he doesn't roll with uh the ibjjf which has you uh, uh usada and yeah. wada and all that yeah. so he, he rolls outside of it but the problem is you're still competing in like adcc and these other flow events which are you and you know ufc fight pass and these other organizations are you know drug tested in this so there's just some interesting stuff but it, it's like bodybuilding though there's What's, what's the terms? Yeah. Basically, no. Or, or I think they call themselves natural. Natural versus. Which those dudes say natural. No, no. No. Off cycle is what it should be called. <laughs> yeah. Like like you see the natural bodybuilders are like bigger than Arnold Schwarzenegger was in the seven, in the 70s and the 80s. So, uh, but I don't know. Um, the one thing which has been universal with a lot of this, um, if you go to the needle and the drugs too early uh, and you're using it to make up for a lack of training, um, just experience and just really proper training. There's like a amateur novice effect when you start lifting weights that there's some super physiological effects and gains and strength that like you will only get as a beginner. Right. And if you do something to bypass and you don't let that happen to maturity, like you don't build the foundation, we call it the base level of strength, the foundation of strength. Like you need to do that. Like that stuff may be down the road, but you got to almost be strong enough to earn the right to do that. Does mm -hmm. that make sense? Mm -hmm. So I think for a lot of these BJJ competitors, because they don't know shit about training, they don't know proper methods. They don't know, you know, like what we do here, power athlete, the deficit they're trying to make up for is to go this route. It's and all you have in your corner. It's so, who you have in your corner advising you like yeah. Victor age 25. You've well, Albeit a different sport, you, you've lived within that competitive realm, yeah. and you've got a wealth of success yeah. and a wealth of failures to share with them. And and, and, I, and I love that. Yeah, and uh, uh, and and then he's got incredible coaches, like with like uh, Shanji Habero. Mm -hmm. You know, Shanji for like fifteen years was like the number one dude. You know, Hodger Gracie's considered the best, but like he's lost three times, twice to you know Shanji, and then uh, his brother Salo raised those guys, and then also uh, Rafael Lovato, who's another incredible dude yeah so i mean the amount it's pretty interesting to sit there with like all you know like to see the uh older kind of mentor coaches that are around victor and these young guys is like you know hall of famers and you know i, I met uh hodger gracie and bushesha and those guys and they were like oh and then he's like oh this is our coach john he does our strength and they were like oh and like oh he played in the nfl for 10 years and then they like looked over and uh you know the idea of like oh you actually found a professional like a person that knows how to do this stuff. Yeah. Wow. I wonder how long that's going to take the other people. All right. We, so we'd love to have Victor on. Yeah. We still, you know, Sean Tyson would love to have Lovato and Victor on yeah. with us to discuss those top yeah. 10 UFC fights. That would be a great episode. And we'll, we'll make sure that we advertise that long enough. I know we do have a guest uh, waiting. So Elias Sakale is a good, good friend of mine. Um, Canadian. Don't hold it against him. Um, well, my mom's Canadian. And that's that's yeah. I knew this was really good. Um, but you know, one, uh, we're gonna go to his past, and I'm gonna pull, uh, you know, if he doesn't admit some of the things in the oh no, as a male model, he does <laughs> do the blue steel up on the, the uh, Mount Everest. Not true, he's got some amazing stories. He personally took me over to Nepal, uh, for my trip over there. He did do the all the uh, the videographer, but you know, it was great having someone who'd been there like 20 plus times. Uh, explaining everything to me, giving me the cultural and the history, historic side. But this guy is a, uh, a stud. And if you can, can you find the, uh, it's in the chat room, 
Oh. Everest has been under a little scrutiny, especially this year, uh, with what's going on from trash to fatalities and just the the safety of it. Um, what I find interesting about mountaineering is one, you either live this life or you're a millionaire who can afford to go climb it or, or you've saved up. But I think a lot of people, you know, it is a great goal to have and they've got the money to do it, but they don't truly understand what they're stepping into. And again, much like you advise Victor, there are levels of guides or Sherpas that you want to you know, associate with <clears throat> sure. ones that are safe and who will make the prudent call of, Hey, we may be close to the peak, but the weather's coming in. Yeah. We're not going to make it this trip. I, I is there like a Sherpa that you can just like strap to his back and he just carries you the whole way? So that's, let me, that's the one I need. Yeah, let's, um, <laughs> we, we've got Elia, but this is uh, the recent article that came out. Spike in Mount Everest deaths this year is due to climate change. Oh, come on. And overcrowding, uh, experts say. Elia, man, thanks for, uh, for joining us. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Climate change, killing everybody. Um, so, you know, how, so you recently, Everest was this, this was, what number of time for you climbing Everest? Yeah, so this was my 11th expedition to Everest. And um, the trip actually that we were on two years ago, that that was, I think, trip 24 to Nepal. But um, yeah, this this would have been the sixth summit and then the 11th expedition to Everest. And you say it would have been the sixth summit. You, you had to make a very uh, tough decision to, to, to pull back. Is that correct? Yeah, well, seemingly tough. Uh, decision, you would think. Um, but I think after, you know, just being there that many times and uh, just understanding the spectrum of problems and just having the experience and knowing what it is that my mission is, which is not about reaching the top of the world, it's really to support the team that I'm with. Um, so yeah, I was I was actually, um, I was climbing with my best mate, uh, PK Sherpa, Pasan Kaji, who worked on, uh, on your trip, actually, with uh, Drop Zone Everest. And PK was guiding a good friend of mine named Yusuf El Shati. Um, he's actually a colonel in the special forces in Kuwait. And so I was there supporting my good friend. I was filming his expedition and he was climbing without supplemental oxygen, which there are less than 300 people on the planet who have achieved that goal versus the thousands that have summited Everest. And in doing my research and talking to people that have summited Everest without supplemental oxygen, NOAA O2, um, they they all spoke about this threshold between 8,600 and 8,700 meters above sea level. So that's almost 28,000 feet. And a lot of people talk about this almost system shutdown where the brain shuts down and they barely remember what happened between 8,600 and 8,848. And so I walked back to catch up with my team. I was flying my drone, doing all kinds of filmmaking stuff. That was the other half of my responsibility. Walked into this scenario and Yusuf was suddenly on supplemental oxygen. So in that moment, I knew the expedition was over. Uh, we weren't going to the top, and my you know core mission was just to help my team get down safely. Have you, have you ever done no uh, O2? Uh, I haven't. No, no. I always say that that um, having the responsibility of cameras and technology and chasing people and running backwards up the mountain that's that's kind of like my version of no O2 because there's this whole set of additional responsibilities. Um, but no, I, every time I'm working, which is every time I'm up on the mountain, for me, the most responsible way to do it is I need to be sharp. I need to you know perform at the highest level, be responsible. So no, I've, I've never tried without supplemental oxygen, but it's, you cannot compare the two. You know, it's kind of like the minor leagues and the major leagues, right? It's just, there's, there's just no comparison whatsoever, you know, to when you're what what, what a lot of purists um, call it. They call it actually, um, you know, uh, oxygen doping, you know, if you will, because what they say is that you essentially reduce the mountain down to your level. You know, it's a very Eastern European mindset where, you know, from their perspective, the most pure way by fair means that you can you know, sort of attack the mountain, if you will, um, is just, you know, going up against the mountain, you versus the mountain versus yourself by fair means without O2. It seems like a physiologic threshold that you wouldn't really have any control over. I mean, you desat to a certain amount. There's only so much oxygen in the environment. You go up and like the level of desaturation you can handle and you can handle and I can handle are all, all different. Like, you know, you see that in the ICUs and places like that. I mean, I, I obviously have no experience with this. I'm just talking from a physiologic standpoint. That just seems like uh, a nuance that wouldn't really matter yeah. to 
to me, if like if either you climbed Everest or you didn't climb, I'm climbing oh, Everest. Did you climb it with oxygen or without? It's, it's, it's like, <sighs> uh, you know, um, yeah. So, and I, I imagine that threshold he's talking about. That's that's probably you know somewhere around the physiologic threshold where people crump and like people, you know, people in uh, like you 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 look at an ICU and kind of they'll have a parameters and be like, hey, when somebody's desatting to this level. You know, it, this is an emergency. Everybody rush in there, and, and you know, let's re- you know, let's. Is there any way to train person. for that? I, you know, I'm sitting here thinking about it. I, I think the the only thing that I could imagine would be how much uh, how much vasculature you have, right? Mm-hmm. So, like we, a lot of our a lot of our vasculature atrophies as we get older, uh, and that's one of the things reasons like hyperbarics and a lot of the peptides and things and and one of the re- one of the main way, ways exercise works like uh you know when you exercise you actually increase something called vegf which is a vascular endothelial growth factor and you'll grow more blood vessels um the more you train the more you perfuse your muscles the more blood vessels you have and the same thing with your brain one of the things that happens with all the tbis is we have brain inflammation and that brain inflammation d de- like uh de- de- neutri- you know decreases the nutrients in that area and you have vascular atrophy and now that region of the brain doesn't work that well and hyperbarics again um you know that actually it's one of the factors when we talked to dan engel if you'll remember about Mm -hmm. the the psychedelics they all increase bdnf Mm -hmm. um astrocyte derived uh growth factors as well and vegf and so that would be my guess and probably primarily the brain like once you once your brain is getting a certain amount of oxygen it's like, or it's dropped to a certain amount of oxygen. It's just like shutting down to survive. And I, I'm seeing the way around it. Cause it wouldn't be hemoglobin saturation or how much hemoglobin you have. It would be like how much is actually getting to your brain. And that that's going to be intracranial pressure. That's going to be vasculature. That's going to be, um, you know, training to some degree but there's just probably a lot of genetic it, luck in that isn't there like a, a point where you have to be at Everest base camp for a certain amount of time to acclimate this is so in, in this goes yeah. into the conversation of, of many yeah. people just don't understand what it takes to climb the mountain it's not show yeah. up at Everest base camp and start the yeah, the process for for those that don't understand can you please walk us through what that process looks like and in, in, in are there varying approaches based off whoever's leading the trip yeah, I'm, I mean, it's important to respect the physiology, right? And uh, we essentially go through a process of acclimatization. So the area above 8,000 meters, this is notoriously known as the death zone. This is where your body can no longer acclimate. You're literally uh, dying. Your body is catabolizing its own tissue in order to survive. And just to, to speak to that uh, previous point for a second, you know, with our experience, we, we just learn to watch people. And oftentimes what you see are people that begin to mask their symptoms and they think that, you know, people around them who have more experience are unaware. And that was one of my responsibilities on this trip that I took on was just to to really carefully watch Yusuf because I know him at sea level, I know him at baseline. And then all of a sudden at 8,000 meters, you know, he starts to act a little bit differently. And, and he was he was really a phenomenal athlete. I've never seen anybody spend two nights in the death zone um you know sleeping sleeping like a baby next to me in my tent um and then you know making it look fairly easy in comparison to most people with supplemental oxygen um and um you know just to to answer your question directly i I mean essentially it's a you know six to eight week expedition there are you know various ways that people you know undertake their acclimatization schedules so traditionally everybody follows the rule of you climb high and you sleep low and so you climb to camp one or camp two, you descend, you'll spend five, six days recovering, you'll reascend the mountain, climb higher to camp three, descend to base camp. And so you're giving your body the opportunity to produce more red blood cells so that you can transport more oxygen. These days, you're seeing different strategies because the, the base of Everest, essentially the area just above base camp, it's called the Kungu Icefall. This is the deadliest area on Everest. You know, a lot of people lose their lives. 16 Sherpas were crushed by an avalanche tragically in 2016. So people want to minimize the amount of time that they're traversing this Kumbu icefall. So what we saw this season is you saw a lot of people that essentially did one giant rotation. So they went to camp one, camp two, they descended to base camp, then they waited for the weather window. And what they do as strategies is they stock oxygen and they stack oxygen. And essentially everybody's breathing three or four liters per minute. 
you'll have eight to 10 bottles of oxygen. And this renders everything more accessible, a little more safe. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, people say, um, you know, it's not necessarily real climbing, if you will, but from a commercial standpoint, it's certainly a, a, an approach that is reducing the, the fatalities and making Everest much more accessible. Are, are they using, a, I'm assuming it's a face mask? Is it like a pilot, like a pilot would wear or something? Or yes. is it more like a medical mask? Through, yeah, through it, up, uh, uh, Instagram, I, I think there's a few pics of you with the mask yeah. on. Yeah, actually, my friend Ted, um, who unfortunately passed away a couple of years ago, is an engineer, uh, adventurer, and mountaineer himself. So he actually designed the top out uh, oxygen system. So it's a mask, um, you know, that's uh, obviously attached to the cylinder that you're you're carrying on your back. Um, and and you know, for the most part, like, and it's it's wild to watch the local people um, who are the ones that are responsible for actually transporting the oxygen tanks, you know, up into the death zone. Um, and when you spend time at 8,000 meters at what they call the South Coal or Camp 4, there are, you know, literally hundreds of bottles, you know, of oxygen that is stashed there. And, you know, it's not the climbers themselves that are carrying this oxygen. It's, it's the, the brave and strong and noble local Sherpa people and other high altitude workers that are, you know, do, doing the impossibly difficult work of transporting all that oxygen, getting it all into place so that there can be, you know, safe summit attempts uh, on the top of the world. So what is that white canister in, in, in front? That's that's not your oxygen bottle, is it? No, this, this is essentially, so this is the top out mask. So this is um, it, essentially, it's you're not breathing, obviously, pure oxygen through the mask. Uh, and Ted could obviously explain it better than I can, but you're getting a stream of pure oxygen mixed with the ambient air um, in the atmosphere. And so that um, excess reserve is essentially flowing into that small bag, um, oh, you. you know, palpating. So you can actually ensure, A, that it's working, uh, and that you're also not, you know, wasting uh, the supplemental oxygen that you're breathing. Oh, yeah. So I've got to, in, in Elia, you explained this to me on my trip over there. I mean, the Sherpas, it, it's yeah. almost like a, a rich white man sport <laughs> and the Sherpas do all the work. And I remember when we landed in Lukla, they're, they're loading up all the bags and, and these guys are having to deal with all the weight. And I'm like, oh man, I feel like a piece of, you know what, right now. And you're like, hey, this is what they do. I understand. Like, like, I felt like I wasn't contributing to the overall effort. Yeah. And the Sherpa is, well, one, people think Sherpa is a, is a job. It's not. It's Correct. It's a set of people Correct. that live within that region. So naturally, physiologically, they're, they're probably just. Yeah, there's there's yeah. natural selection yeah. for them just to live there in the first place. Yes. And then, and then they're yeah. adapting to it every day. Well, but then they have a genetic adapted. component, too, because they've lived there. For, Correct. That's what I'm saying. Correct. That That's the natural selection. Yeah. Like, they would, the people who can handle that would die off. And the ones that procreate are the ones who can <laughs> handle it, you know. Yeah. Yeah. But in in. What I want people to understand is that they do almost everything. And it, it, well, they are, of course, as they set people up for success to, uh, to yeah. ascend. Yeah, I'm, I mean, I would say that, uh, including myself, you know, the majority of people, more than 99% would not be able to summit Everest without the support of, and not just Sherpas, you know, these days, um, you know, it, initially it was all under the umbrella of Sherpas, if you will. Um, you know, today it's more politically correct to, to use the term Nepalese climbers, which includes, you know, Rise and Tamongs and, and other cast members, but the majority are the, the local Sherpa people of the mountain. And, and, you know, as you say, it, it's incredibly humbling because you do all the work here at sea level, right? And you're trained and you're mentally strong and you're prepared. Um, and then you show up there and, and all of that preparation seems like it's for nothing because you're weak, you're beaten down, and you just don't act, have access to the power because you don't have the acclimatization in place. So particularly in the beginning of an expedition, it's incredibly humbling. And then through and throughout, I mean, you, you know, you're, you're doing your thing, uh, you showed up responsibly, and then these guys just kind of zip by with you know 30 kilograms on their backs with a burlap strap you know strapped to their head and they got a smile on their face and they're they're making it look easy um so yeah the, the vast yeah, they probably amount weigh of, like 100 and 135 so they're pounds like they're yeah, small guys like, yeah when, when i was in yeah. peru for uh, when karen kelly ran that inca trail marathon and that's you know that's the toughest marathon in the world they they had sherpas that were setting up tents and stuff for them to sleep in the night before and these guys I mean, they were so small. They were 130 pounds, just little, you know, uh, little dudes, and the packs, the packs on them, 
were three times their size and they're just yeah. walking along like nothing yeah. and you have all these people who've been training to run this thing feeling great i'm like i would feel like an idiot you know like because these, these dudes went ahead of them set everything up then did the trail set everything up again then did the trail then brought so they did like 27 down. different marathons so, so they did like five times with the people who went there to run <laughs> yeah. they're hard these, these people are hard by yeah. necessity and i remember when we're on the, on the trail from lukla to uh to namchi you're watching like young kids being bathed in what has to be what high 40s 50 degree water and they're they're not screaming where our children would just yeah. be like screaming yeah. bloody murder well, by by necessity they're hard and i have no doubt you go back to the to the wild wild west people had to be hard back then it's just we've become so comfortable creature comforts right that we've we've lost that hardness well and, yeah, and, think, and my, think about the people who settled america or you know came across in wagons and just yeah. like where we live just where we live just think about it, just coming across here in a wagon well i mean just the fact that like, going uh, two miles an like, hour like for the story months. of the comanches <laughs> yeah it's yeah. like unbelievable yeah yeah we're, um, we're soft <laughs> i uh so when when I, I think i told you guys the story when i was playing the nfl dr Inkladon sent me a hypoxic chamber and so i basically set it up around my bed because i ended up gassing out at the playing against the broncos and he's like i got this hypoxic chamber so he sends it to me and I built it around my bed and then I pumped in and it basically reduced the oxygen down to Everest base camp, but I had to acclimatize into it. Mm -hmm. And when people would come over, uh, I would be like, Hey, just let me set it up and just go in there for like 30 minutes. And people would have an absolute freak out. And I used to sleep headaches, in it. Yeah. Headaches. Oh yeah. They, they'd feel sick. They didn't want to be yeah. in it. And I, we thought it was hysterical and I, I just go in there and hang out. And, uh, yeah, it ended up being, then when I went to go back to play the Broncos, I was like, <sighs> felt fine. Um, but yeah, I slept at Everest Base Camp for like a year. It was weird. So if you ever invited girls over, it was kind of strange too, because I'd like to grip them in there and like set it up. <laughs> what weird stuff are you into? This, this chick's like, oh, this, this tent is this, this weird tent and this oxygen thing. This, I'm like, this has a Bill Cosby feel to it. <laughs> yeah. on. I was like, you guys can voluntarily stay or you can sleep on the couch, yeah. whatever you need. Well, and, and, oh, and yeah. just on just on that, just quickly, uh, there are actually rapid acclimatization programs that are offered by some companies now. You know where you do your pre-acclimatization long before you show up and and i, th I think on choyu one of the records i don't know if it was a week or two gate to gate i think it might have been a week uh, where they pre-acclimatized in the hypoxic tent showed up in tibet you know scaled choyu which is uh, a couple hundred meters lower than everest and then gone out of uh, got out of dodge pretty quick and and the argument for this is you know not only your time away but it's less exposure and in, in a lot of these uh, danger zones on the mountain and <laughs> And we saw that this year, you know, we, we were there for 65 days and, you know, living at altitude and Mike, you got a good taste of it. It's difficult. You know, it, it takes a beating on your body. It takes a beating on your mind. Um, and this year there was a, there was a brutal virus that was circulating um, mm -hmm. around base camp. Um, I was actually a, a victim of that. I was sick for, you know, three, four weeks, didn't know what the hell was going on, but just that lengthy exposure. Um, and then the exposure on the mountain, it's just, it just, you know, raises the stakes, if you will. So people are finding clever ways to minimize that. Um, and it seems to be working. So the, um, I, I saw this with the people in, um, South America, like the people that lived at altitude, uh, the people that have like grown up and lived it in genetically, like it actually acts as anti-aging, like they don't age as fast, but then when you take people that are at the base and you put them up there, it ages you in dog years. Yeah. So I wonder the genetic components. Well, you know, Elliot, it seems like uh, Mount Everest is taking a lot of scrutiny this year. Uh, in particular, yeah. I know 12, uh, 12 deaths, five missing. What, yeah. what in your opinion, uh, what, what's, what's going on? Yeah, what's going on? Um, you know, we saw something similar happen and, and I have unfortunately been at the wrong place at the right time or the right place at the wrong time, depending how you look at it and have been in the middle of these disasters over and over. And I was there in, in 14, uh, when 16 Sherpas died, then 15 during the earthquake when 18 died, and then in 2019 when 11 people died. And that was the year of the quote-unquote traffic jam that made international headlines around the world. And it was an oversimplified explanation of a very nuanced and complex situation on the mountain. Um, and I, I started investigating this. And I just thought, you know what, some of this doesn't add up. And somebody who understands the environment that then reads the headlines and the nuances that are reported, you just start asking questions. You go, well, this doesn't make sense. And so what I started to see is that um, this became a case of inexperience combined with poor leadership, combined in some instances, not all, um, with negligence that needs investigation. 
Um, and all of this stacked together. And then in 11, what we saw was, was sort of the perfect storm where the traffic actually, what it did was it exposed the weaknesses. It exposed the problems, um, th the real problems. And so this year, um, I haven't done that. I haven't investigated every single death, but same problems, you know, too many people on the mountain, too many people um, that are so permits that are not physically prepared, mentally prepared, that lack the experience. Combined with this, this new issue that started developing where you have low budget operators that are essentially coming in. And what they're doing is they're, they're providing logistical services. And this idea of providing logistical services seems to have become this sort of get out of jail free card where people wipe their hands free of it and say, well, you know, we just sold that person a cheap trip. We were not necessarily responsible for them. They were responsible for themselves. And, you know, if you look at that business model and flip that over to the West here, it would never fly. There would be lawsuits and there would be charges and investigations. And it just seems to be the wild east out on Everest. The other thing is that it's, it's, it's absolutely worth stating that, you know, there are a lot of really good actors out there. There are a lot of responsible local companies and foreign companies. And it's as though the standards of safety are just much higher with those that have the experience and you're getting foreigners that are looking to save some money um a couple you know thousand dollars tens of thousands of dollars and the next thing you know they're in a situation where their life is on the line and then the ripple effect of that is that the local people's lives are on the line because they need to save them um, and then you hear these stories where you know those local people um, have to abandon their clients in order to save themselves right in the death zone you got to remember like you're on the edge of space almost there's almost nothing that you can do. And so when we see these superhuman efforts by Sherpas that are literally carrying people on their backs, um, I mean, it's unbelievable to think about the reality of being able to do that. I mean, we can barely, you know, tie our, 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 our crampons onto our boots. That's how exhausting it is. So when you see a Sherpa like that, but what you don't see are the guys that end up with frostbite, you know, who end up losing, you know, fingers or toes because of reckless behavior on the mountain because some people tried to save some money. Is it a um, is there a substantial increase in the number of permits permits? Um, so is it you know percentage wise is it equally as safe and you're just putting more people through there, or do you think it's uh, too like too many people coming through and lowering safety standards and like it's a much higher percentage of people who are having injury like you know severe casualty or death? Yes, it's, it's a good question. Um, I mean, this year, I believe the number was 468 permits that were sold. And you have to remember that, you know, I think the stats are something like, you know, 1.6 local people, so Sherpas or other uh, indigenous, you know, tribes that are working on the mountain support every person that has a permit. You know, so this year you, you had over 1,200 people that were heading to the summit. And 2011 or 2019 was a perfect storm because you had a very narrow weather window, right? So you only had a couple of days where you could attempt the summit. So everybody charged and went for the summit at the same time. This year, um, and Mike to the statement about climate change um, or the excuse you know, of climate change, it absolutely was a very cold year on Everest. The weather was unstable, unpredictable, overcast, um, you know, snowing a lot, very cold. Um, but everybody rushed during that that first window because they were afraid that there wasn't going to be a second one. But those of us that had, you know, weather forecasts that we trusted and had the patience and the experience to wait, we didn't get into issues as a result of that. So are there a lot of people? Absolutely, there are a lot of people. Arguably, are there too many people? Yeah. Um, is that going to change in the near future? I doubt it. Um, there's a lot of money involved. Um, you know, the, the Nepal government makes a lot of money because of these permits. So, um, so you, and that, you said that's like, not something that's going to happen. You, you said, I think, 468. Like, how, how do you know how many were sold 10 years ago or 20 years ago? I mean, it is, is that no, that's kind of been that's, the same for a while? Um, there, there's some data, data on, um, on, uh, it's called the Himalayan database. So, so they've got all the, the stats, but that's 468 permits sold this year. Um, in 2019, I believe there was 70 or so less. Um, so more and more people are yeah. buying permits, wanting to climb Everest. And, and so much of that correlates to, to the rise of, you know, web two and social media. Um, and sort of the, the the reward system, you know, that comes along with, 
you know, flashing your photos on top of the world, you know, the, the glory photos, and then bypassing and failing to mention how you got there, and, and really everything else, you know, that, that's going on on the mountain at the same time. And, and that's where we we're running into yeah. problems. <laughs> what, uh, what's the cost? Like, is there a monetary? Does it cost like a, a hundred thousand, a million? I mean, I don't know what yeah. the, it's the financial obligation. Top end, low end. Yeah, top, I mean, top end, low end. I mean, it's it's eleven thousand uh, dollars, you know, for the permit, right? So, average price, you know, these days you're looking at you know sixty five, seventy five thousand dollars for the competent operators. Um, this year, you know, <laughs> a local friend of mine sent me this photograph in this massive white dome with you know a king size bed. Uh, for one person that paid, you know, well over a hundred thousand dollars, you know, for that that amount of comfort, the low end operators it can range anywhere from you know twenty thousand dollars to thirty five thousand um, dollars, and and you get what you pay for. And when you cut corners on Everest, unfortunately, it has a ripple effect and it puts people's lives at risk. And I always say, I, you know, the, I can't the wrap my head around. Responsible. Like I want to climb Everest, but I want to do it in the most comfort. Like way. How, like, how does a Sherpa even get a king size bed up? I mean, like, oh, no, they just, <laughs> these guys are absolute like like helicopters. They're, they're like warrior ants. They just like carry stuff. But like, think about it. Like, like I I would imagine that you're like investing in this idea of climbing Everest. There's something of the purity of like I have to suffer a little bit. Like I want to climb Everest because I want to get my selfie, but I don't want to suffer to get there. Like uh, it, it robs uh, it robs the experience. Yeah, you should just push those people off the top yeah, of the backside of that. Yeah, thing. Yet alone, like to be just surrounded by hundreds of people in base camp, it just wouldn't seem like if I go into nature. Did you know they have prostitutes at base camp? I was doing some research, and Come they on. were they were running a prostitution <laughs> ring at base camp. Hell yeah, I, I haven't heard that one. Uh, okay, <laughs> that, but you just started a good rumor. What? You should write an article. Well, about. that there's a brothel at base camp. Yes. That's what they said on the internet, and everybody believes everything on the internet. It's, it's true. Yeah, everything it's on, on the, the internet, internet is true. true. It's on. The... <laughs> but they they they, they, they yeah. say a lot. I mean, <laughs> well, I I was actually hoping to ask him because he would know. But I'm like, what's what is this brothel like? I mean, so and then you, how do you acclimatize these, yeah, these girls? Sure. Well, they're sherpas. They're <laughs> them, right? So the the Hungarian that yeah. uh, that passed away, you actually were in close proximity to him. We uh, were. Yeah, we were. We were. Our, our, our summit day was um, was was complicated. And um, yeah, there was a climber from uh, from Hungary. And of course, at the time, you know, everybody's dressed in, in down suits, colorful down suits, red, green, yellow. Um, he happened to have been dressed in red and yellow. And our climber, Yusuf, um, he passed him, who was also climbing without supplemental oxygen. And this gentleman was very slow. And I tried to talk to him just to check in with him to ask him if he was OK he was unresponsive and i assume that you know most people who are attempting to climb without o2 they're just cut from a different cloth you know there's there's a a, a mentality that they have that an extreme athlete can relate to so i understood the commitment and i just assume you know maybe he's russian maybe he doesn't speak english so so we kept climbing and he didn't look like he was you know in distress at all just that he was tired and then essentially, I explained what happened with, with our climber who made it to what they call the south summit of Everest. And so on descent, we crossed paths with this climber once again. And it was quite late in the day at that point. You know, it was, it was past two o'clock in the afternoon. And historically, you know, your turnaround times on Everest are 11 a.m. at the latest. But we happened to have perfect weather that day. So as we were descending, I just kept looking back. Right? And, and I was a thousand feet below watching this you know tiny figure in the distance just relentlessly make his way to the top and you know the sun was setting and it's you know it's very dangerous you know to be attempting the summit at that hour and i i just didn't know you know what was going to happen when we last crossed him you know he was in good shape he was still moving and then you know a couple hours later still up on the ridge and then unfortunately uh, it was reported that he was seen the next morning um incapacitated not in good shape with frostbite um and apparently with cerebral edema um near the hillary step and when a rescue team was deployed which ironically happened to be the same sherpa gelji who was carrying the climber on his back um, they didn't find him tragically did you guys see he, that video he yeah got he's got the guy in the, the sleeping bag yeah yeah, yeah, yeah that, it strapped him to his back and was i mean so you, you got to when, you, when you're paying street. fifty thousand so, dollars so are the sherpas are, are the sherpas wearing oxygen the Sherpas are using supplemental oxygen. Um, traditionally, they're using much less than foreigners. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, it's something that I always try to, 
to to make sure that my guys on my team because it's, you know everything that I do I do because of the support that I have from local people so I try to make sure that they have as much oxygen as they want um, there is some pride involved um, so they don't always want you know maximum flow um, you know in my case with PK um, you know he had ample oxygen with him so they are but they're not breathing anywhere near the flow rates that foreigners are and they always have less bottles of oxygen um, than foreigners do traditionally. Wow. I, I understand right. if somebody pays, let's say $60,000, you're, you know, you're close to the, to the summit, mm -hmm. but a guide makes a decision of, yeah. you know, we, we just got a weather report. This isn't looking good. We're, we're going down. I mean, that's a difficult situation to deal in, deal with in a client, with a client who's come all that way and pay all that money. That's difficult. Well, I mean, uh, yeah. I, I, uh, is it weird that he's, I have zero not, desire to do this? He's not, he's not, uh, he's, not I was, he's not paying to get to the summit. He's paying for the experience. Of yeah. He wants to see, he wants to see the brothel. Yeah. Right? Okay. <laughs> um, I, I watched like, uh, in prep for this, I watched a bunch of stuff and I think it's amazing to see and like mm -hmm. the scenery looks great. And I'm like, I'm just totally happy to see this. There's, there was not a single inkling in me that was like, man, I want it's to about as attractive as an ultra marathon to me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> let's, like, let's put it in perspective. Yeah, whatever. I think for me, it's more of the time eight to six weeks is a lot of time. And, and I hate to, it was a wonderful experience to see it jumping out of the helicopter. Yeah. But we didn't have to acclimatize. Yeah. It was a quick process. We got to see it and we saw it from a unique perspective. Yeah. I understand why people get into the sport. I can understand why it's addictive, but it just takes so much time. Yeah. I mean, yeah. well, I mean it, it'd be like, Hey, uh, I want to do this ultra marathon, but uh, I'm going to do it on roller skates. Like, it's like, well then like, just, I don't know. It just feels like there has to be some effort, like the danger, the suffering. Like, I don't know if like, oh, I'm going to go sleep here in my king size bed. I'm like, dude, that sounds, I don't know. I, Elia. I think, I think it's, if I, if I could just say something about that, you know, I think it's important to remember as well that everything that, that we're discussing here, I mean, this is the commercialized side of, of quote unquote climbing or mountaineering. Right. And, and by, you know, alpinism standards, you know, the, the classic routes that we're talking about here, this is the one that was pioneered in 1953 by Sir Edmund Hillary Tenzing Norgay. Um, within the alpinism community, it's not a respected goal anymore. However, it's incredibly important to, to note that if you look at somebody like Killian Jornet, for example, you know, who is climbing solo up the West Ridge of Everest where less than you know, a handful of people have, have summited to be completely on his own in the purest style possible without supplemental oxygen, you know, that's alpinism, you know, and yeah. that's why, you know, they label, you know, the high altitude mountaineering, high altitude tourism these days. So there's this vast difference between the commercial climber and the actual alpinist. If you're doing it for chicks, though, they don't know. Well, you just say, hey, I climbed Everest. Yeah, but I mean, I, has they, anyone ever really yeah, I mean, gotten would attractive that women for that? I, I don't know. I mean, should, should we I mean, go out and be like, I don't hey, know why else. I mean, that's like somebody saying, not doing it for chicks. Well, I, I played what, in the NFL and girls were like, cool story, bro. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. Whatever. This guy's, loser. A seal, this guy's a seal. I'm going on with him. Yeah. It's, it's a true story. You know, uh, but but I mean, then then you have to tell war stories back. So there I was. So you just by I killed Bin Laden. Elliot, can you talk? And this this is a crazy story. Can you talk about K2 in the whole ordeal with the recovery or are you still keeping that close wraps? Yeah, no, I mean, we can, if you have questions about that, yeah, I'd love to, love you, to share. I, I think yeah. the audience would love to hear this story because this is insane. Sure. He basically was helping out Pakistan, but then got run out of the country, uh, but trying to recover two of his, uh, his, uh, his brothers from the other uh, mountain who were deceased and still up there. Correct. Uh, one of, yes, correct. Yeah. It's uh, that's a, a very condensed, <laughs> <laughs> it's a great great log line but um yeah i, I mean in in brief i mean 2021 i mean there are 14 8000 meter peaks um in the world and they had all been conquered up until 2021 um and to do them in winter is just a whole other challenge right minus 50 degrees minus 80 degree um you know temperatures up there and essentially 2021 was a race to the top and so you had quite a number of sort of commercial clients that were, you know, trying to conquer the peak. Um, you had an amazing team of Nepalese Sherpas, you know, that were also uh, attempting the summit led by Nirmal Persia. Um, and then you had this small team of underdogs, John Snorri, Ali Sapara, and Sajid Sapara. And, you know, my job is, I'm a storyteller, you know, I'm in the filmmaking industry. I'm also an adventurer and do a bunch of other things, but you know, that's my core line of work. And I'm always 
looking for these stories. And, and to me, I felt like there's like absolutely no way K2 in winter is not going to be summited by the Nepalese team this year. Like that was hands down going to be the outcome. And it was, and they, you know, made history and, and they made it look quite easy. It was absolutely amazing um, what they achieved. Um, but I wanted to support the underdogs and Ali Sapara, the nation's sort of unsung hero at the time, if you will, and his son, um, essentially long story short, I supported their expedition. Um, I in, inserted myself, if you will, with Pasang Kaji Sherpa, and then we were you know, trying to keep up with them. It was a ridiculous effort trying to keep up with guys that had been on the mountain for six weeks. And long story short, you know, tragically, they, they disappeared near the summit. And Sajid Sapara, Ali Sapara's son survived, and John Snorri, um, Ali Sapara, and Juan Pablo Mora, Chilean climber, never returned. And the reason that we survived, PK and I, and Fazal Ali, was because we had the humility to, to turn back and we couldn't source our supplemental oxygen and we assessed the situation and we just said, look, man, you know, this sucks. Um, this is going to appear as a defeat, but it's just not worth risking our lives. And so we turned back. Um, they were never found. And I was part of this 14 day, you know, search and rescue operation where, you know, the military um, asked me to, you know, embark on one of their helicopters and to photograph what we thought could be our friends. Um, and 14 days later, they were never found. And obviously an impossible situation and the nation was mourning. And it was this complex moment because here you had uh, the Nepalese team that made history and it was you know, supposed to be this historic accomplishment and it was, but it was just marred with sadness and loss and death. And um, so just a yeah, real impossible situation um, that I was at the center of. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, the bodies have been located they, they were seen on the mountain. Is that correct? Yeah. Well, so in winter, um, they were never found. And I had to zip off to Everest for, for a film that I was shooting on the local Sherpa people. And the whole time I was obsessing about K2, thinking about our friends, thinking about young Sajid who survived. And I just, I wanted to do something. And I was, I was paying attention to what Sajid's plans were going to be. And he just wasn't getting the support that he needed to go and mount a search operation to find his dad. And so with like three weeks notice, I was just looking at all this going, like, I can't sit here and do nothing. I can't not help this kid and help facilitate, you know, an expedition where we can be a part of this. We can help him go and try to locate his fallen father. And ultimately, um, yeah, through the expedition together with the help of some friends behind the scenes, my mate PK Sherpa led the expedition. We had a couple of local Pakistani climbers and, you know, against all odds, Ali, John and Juan Pablo Moore were found. And ultimately we were able to bury Ali Sapara at 7,900 meters above sea level on the world's second tallest mountain. And it was just an unbelievably emotional experience and watching young Sajid go through that was, was heartbreaking, impossible. And yet at the same time, you know, we felt we felt really good that we took the risk um, and that we supported him and that he was able to do what what he ended up doing for his dad. And to answer your question, yes, John, unfortunately, is is still up there. There was there was nothing we could do. We were under supported, a small team of underdogs. So we had to leave John. Um, but we managed to bury Ali at 8000 meters. Wow. That's, it's almost like the the death zone is, a, is equivalent to to the open ocean. Once you're once you're gone. You're staying up there for the most part. Yeah. Well, it's 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 like the commitment of of no supplemental oxygen. You know, once you're in, you're in. You know, there's there, there's no turning back. And unfortunately, you know, there's this intoxicating allure, you know, of reaching that summit, and people become obsessed. And you know, we see it a lot. We see people who become very irrational, and it's all about their 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 summit glory. And unfortunately, good men good men died on that expedition. And you know, there are you know, children that are left without their fathers and, and widows. And, you know, that for me is uh, is a tremendous loss as well, because, you know, that you know, vicarious trauma gets gets passed on to them. Um, so it's, it, it's complicated. And that's why, you know, you, you got to approach these mountains with respect. You, know, you have to be humble you know, you got to you got to bow down with reverence, you know, because you know, I mean, nature is going to control the outcome. And, you know, the mountain doesn't care who you are, where you're from, how much money you have. Um, it's really about showing up, uh, you know, with humility 
um, prepared and uh, in the most responsible way possible. Don't confuse your enthusiasm with your capability. And we see that so often where, I mean, we, that was a mantra within our profession is, yeah. is brand new seals would, we call it, you know, the Dunning-Kruger effect, the, yeah. the peak of Mount Stupid. Oh, we can do this. Mm -hmm. It's like, no, you're, you're actually, you don't have the experience. You're not equipped yeah. and, and you got to talk them off uh, a ledge. Um, Elliot, you've got some documentaries in the works. Where can people find you? And uh, what's, what's, what's the future hold for you, man? Yeah, so uh, thanks for asking that. Um, so there are two films um, that are in the works, documentary features. There's, there's one on K2. Um, there's one on the season on Everest in 2019 that we spoke about as well. Uh, you can find me at Elias Akeley um, on Instagram, Facebook, uh, all the channels. And as far as the what's next, um, I'm just off the mountain. So trying to trying to recover, take care of myself, you know, self-care. Um, that's a high priority. And then also working on a book, which is which is exciting. Um, so that's in the pipeline. And uh, from there, we'll see. Right on. That's amazing. So guys, we, we have a few questions and Elliot, please stick around. So we'll, we'll start. Sure. I've got the first one and, and Will's going to pull up more. I, I actually love this one. What advice do you give young men growing up in such an anti-masculine world? And we've talked about this earlier. I mean, we all, before the, uh, the podcast started is that what we found is in the in, do we in, have to live in that world no you you I don't, don't live but in that world the young men to. i wouldn't even say young men i'd say men across the the spectrum are yearning for coaching and mentorship from what and i hate to use the word traditional masculine men just men i mean because we are inundated again social media people without credibility who've got a microphone saying the same exact thing uh about discipline i've, I've heard <laughs> more about discipline, I think, in the last two years than I did in my entire 20 years in the, uh, the military. It's like, we get it. We get it. But that's a great question for, let's say, young men in schools who are not surrounded by strong, it's not male, just strong leaders. What, what, you know, let's start with Elliot. Elliot, what, do you, what, what, what would you advise young men uh, struggling to, to find coaches and mentors? Yeah, I mean, um, just to personalize for a second, I was very fortunate to have incredible men around me when I was 16, 17 years old, you know, coaches that I could trust and, um, you know, men that were good role models. So I, I, I think a lot of it starts there. Um, I think there's so much BS and noise and nonsense out there. And I think it's just crucial to just understand how to just get rid of that noise. Um, and to understand that, I mean, you can be you know, brave and strong and powerful and determined. Um, and you can be all these things, but you can also be soft and real and vulnerable and transparent and be in touch with your emotions. And that that is strength as well. Um, and, and I think as a starting point, I mean, those are, those would be the guidelines um, where I would begin. Yeah, for me, I, I for me, I, I, I think masculine energy is, is really just all about self-determination, right? So we're kind of, the masculine is, is uh, directed towards per procurement, um, protection, provisioning. Um, so it's like going out, making something of yourself, um, making the world a better place, raising a family, protecting a family, providing for people, providing, mentoring young people, whatever it is um and just and just having the courage to keep doing that regardless of what the noise is i mean i, I think that's um because because the noise is the noise is so irrational you can't even quantify it anymore right because they, they just scream something different every day and all it basically means is we don't want competitive men out there trying to do great things uh because it makes us feel bad about ourselves and that that's kind of what it's about so for, um for me it's uh you know, set goals, work towards your goals, find good people to help you uh, along the path of those goals and uh, just be real and honest and, and have the courage to do what you know, you, you know, you need to do because we all, we all know what it is. Like it's not, well, it's not that complex. <clears throat> and, and I think that that gets rid of everybody else's opinion because it's like, well, you can say whatever you want, but I'm heading that way and you can throw things this way and that way and shout and whatever, but that's where I'm going. And uh, and I have a reason for doing that. And I, I got a good group of people around me. And to me, that's, that's kind of the essence of masculinity. Amen. 
as you guys know, I'm kind of a nerd, but um, as a rhetoric major, one of the um, the quotes I actually have it in my bathroom and I have it in my son's room, which is from Seneca, which is a gem cannot be polished without friction nor a man perfected without trials. So I think being able to set up these trials um, and then even to quote one of my favorite movies, Almost Famous, where she says, you know, be bold and mighty forces will come to your aid. Like have big dreams and do things. And what I've found, especially for myself and also the athletes I've worked with, if they have lofty goals, people are willing to support you if you're crazy enough to try to attempt something. But and, I, uh, I think that <clears throat> I, I think that can get in the way because for you know, some some people grew up in a made a lot of bad choices, grew up in a shit environment. They just send their to Alcoholics Anonymous and like staying sober one more day is like a plenty goal for them. <laughs> and then once they do that for 30 days, like getting a job, serving coffee and like showing up to work every day and then like joining a gym or starting jujitsu or something. Like it doesn't have, you don't have to be aiming to be the top of the world. It's just like, you've got to be working towards something you know is valuable yeah but isn't everybody's perception a little bit different like um, um yeah you know, i mean i'm just i'm challenging like, the word lofty goals i agree with you think about goals. like at some point somebody stood at the bottom of everest looked up to it and thought i'm going to climb that right like that's not my goal and if i stood there i'd be like wow that looks pretty bitch and i'd you know send me a picture but like there's other goals i've wanted to attain and i think um you know the lack of hardship and mike was talking <laughs> a little bit about it um doesn't do anything to shape people you know, I mean, you think right. about the Grand Canyon was cut by water over time and friction and this. It wasn't, you know, so I, I like I don't know if as a man or even as a person, if you can develop without some form of friction, without trials, without, you know, successes and failures and reevaluating and doing this. Like like the fact that um, uh, what even bothers me more is the fact that there's people that had a Sherpa carry a king size bed up at Everest because they just wanted to do it. Like, uh, like, like, and, and I, I know why he said that, like, no longer is this considered a task because now you can buy your we, way to we the We would top. all call that guy a bitch. Yeah. And like, like when he came you, you down and he showed king, me his bed, I'd punch him. Yeah. You needed a king size bed. You're a bitch. No, no. Like sleep on the ground. <laughs> Above John's head is, uh, the, uh, what would they call the man in the arena speech by Teddy Roosevelt, which actually came from this, uh, citizen in the Republic yeah. speech, but we also I, have it in my podcast room. Do you? <laughs> everybody should have this and, and there's a point where i'm going with this one you're absolutely right um you are defined by hardship you are defined by by you know one we all know you do not grow unless you push yourself outside your physical and mental comfort zones that's where true learning and growth uh takes place that's where the scars are developed that ultimately character is forged from but i, I was going to go back to say you know to this quote is like well first off stop listening to media whether left or right don't apologize for being a man and one person I like, and I know he's mainstream, is Jordan Peterson, who, who talks about this. Be dangerous. But what makes being dangerous even more masculine is knowing when and when not to use it. Just because you can crush somebody doesn't mean you should. You know, we are in a weird time. And the way I put it is everyone wants to attack men, especially, let's be honest, from the left. Um, when I think they're looking at the wrong males, there's a lot of guys that talk tough. We even saw this in the seals, the guys who were the biggest guy who to talk tough, but when the round started to fly, they wouldn't leave the, the security of the cover they were behind. And it was the quiet guy who would get up and charge ahead. So, you know, we want you to be strong in his, to, to Ellie's point, but I, you know, what I've come to learn is vulnerability or emotional intimacy amongst any group and, and being vulnerable is where trust is formed for Young men who don't have access to traditional coaches, or maybe they're they're just in a bad situation, I would say read. Yeah. It is it is mentorship through readership. Read about Teddy Roosevelt. Go pick up a book. Try to emulate the breadcrumbs that they leave, because that was one of the biggest uh, you know adventurers and explorers yeah. in American history. Yeah. So go out, you know. And and I think of Dwayne Fields, which is an amazing story. Who grew up in the uh, I forget what he calls it. It's it's like the burbs of London, dirt poor. Uh, Black Britain, and he was the first guy to, to walk the North Pole. He said, I needed something different. I needed to do something that no one had ever done, something that was so hard that was going to test me. Get outside your, your urban environment or whatever environment, go into the wilderness, start to learn from there. Because the wilderness, and to your point, Elia, mm -hmm. nature always wins. Nature is going to yeah. be the, 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 the best forger, uh, forger of, of men. Yeah. Yeah. The great equalizer. 
No, yeah, I mean, and, 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 Teddy Roosevelt's amazing. Like the Rough Riders and all that. Like, in, in, incredible dude. And, and I, I think, you know, the, the confusion and, and the modern parlance and media, the completely non nuanced, uh, as he was speaking about earlier, uh, headline kind of media, um, you know, they're, they're, they're equating, uh, you know, masculinity, all of what they're calling toxic masculinity, it's, it's really psychopathy, right? I mean, um, you can be strong and dangerous and um, a badass man and be a psychopath. Unfortunately, the only person who can stop that is another strong, badass man who's not a <laughs> psychopath. <laughs> and so you you have to have masculinity or the psychopaths will just rule the world. They just run the world, you know, and, and whether it's, whether that's, you know, through lawfare or warfare or, or whatever, the psychopaths will just dominate everybody if if regular men aren't strong strong enough to stop them. This, like this, this is where I think people get it wrong. What what was the uh, the Hollywood uh, actor who used his position not only or strength as male and his his uh, role as a uh, he, he went to you know the the whole um, Me Too movement was based off this guy. I'm, I'm oh um, no, he was the producer. Yeah, um, producer uh, Harvey Weinstein. Harvey Weinstein. Right. That guy's not a man. Mm -hmm. it, that is not a man. No, no that wasn't masculinity. That that's was, not masculinity. That, that's that predatory. Well, yeah, he's yeah. a predator. Yeah, he's a predator. And and that's not our definition of man. And I think that's what's wrong too. You're looking at the wrong. Uh, but the only reason he's figures. in prison is because there are strong men. Yeah, that put but, him there. Yeah, and right. women that stepped up right. and, and had the courage, even though yeah. media beat them down, which yeah. was sad to see. We do have one. Well, Go ahead. It was because like Oprah and uh, Whoopi Goldberg and all the women on the View were all who were on Epstein's boat playing too they were the ones like oh he's an amazing person so i don't know man it's a um, very two-faced kind of scummy we do have a uh, a question for Relia, and we'll finish here what's the biggest lesson you've learned from all of this all your time on the mountain and what would you have told your younger self um i mean my greatest lessons have come through my failures and the greatest takeaway for me has just been reinforced humility, you know, throughout all of this. And, you know, as I said earlier, I mean, the, the mountain is the great equalizer. You know, it, it doesn't matter who you are, where you're from, what you've done. Um, so it's the, the humility that I've taken away. And I think that that humility really has, has kept me alive. Uh, I've lost a lot of friends up there. I've seen a lot of very competent climbers, unfortunately, make some bad decisions. Um, and not return accidents happen. And, and so that for me, and that extends everywhere in my life. Um, and ultimately that ripples into, you know, kindness and empathy and caring about other human beings. And, you know, every time I'm up on that mountain, you know, I'm much more concerned with what's going on around me um, than I am of my own, you know, physical pursuit or, or desire to, you know, get to the top. Um, so that's been a huge takeaway. And the, the local people of Nepal have just reinforced that. Um, because they embody that. Um, so that's, that's, that's really changed my life. And what would I say to my younger self? Um, don't take it all so seriously, man. <laughs> Just, you know, be focused, be determined and, and do what you're doing. But, you know, laugh at yourself along the way as well. Um, because it's just, you know, we're, we're here for one ride and how, you know, fortunate are we to even exist um, and to be alive. And so, yeah, there was, there was a part of me in my earlier years where I was just fiercely determined, uh, a lot of sacrifice to obviously get to where I am as, as all of the, you know, men in this room. Um, but, uh, yeah, just, just, just have, have a bit more fun. Um, and don't take it all so seriously. That's what we call wisdom Yeah, uh, with age. You know, the one thing we didn't talk about, which we, 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 the everyday warrior, our crew is going to have to go over to Nepal, at least just go into Namchi is the coolest experience even if you don't go beyond mm. but um we watched in um Kathmandu an open air cremation have you ever it's the hindu culture yeah where they burn bodies right there in the public yeah. and they start with the the face based off of you know their, their their beliefs it was just very interesting to watch very fortunate that they they allow people to come and, and be part of the ceremony and you know very respectful very humbling but uh that's a conversation for a, uh, a different time. Ellie, I can't thank you enough for, uh, for joining us. Uh, any closing words, guys, takeaways, um, you know, I mean, brothels and well, uh, no, no, I, I mean, I'm, I'm <laughs> fascinated on Kate. Uh, find uh, out about the bro. <laughs> like the K2 on, like, thing is wild just because, into this. because John, K2 not is not as high, but much more treacherous. Right. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. how many, how many people climb K2 compared to Everest? 
Well, what they call this that. How many people? Um, I mean, you're you're talking about uh, hundreds versus thousands. Yeah, and and they call the Savage Mountain the mountain that's trying to kill you, um, and that and that's what it can feel like. And and they say you know uh, K two is I mean it's like versus Everest, Everest is Disneyland in comparison. Um, it's it's the real deal. It's the Savage Mountain. It's incredibly steep. You know there are rocks flying at you like bullets the entire way. Um, so it's incredibly dangerous. And so you know the the attempted um, you know feat in twenty twenty one. It, it was a really big deal. You know that made headlines around the world. Um, and I, and I is, hope that the height difference completely insignificant. Is the technical yeah, nature of it? I mean, I mean, like how 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 much height difference are we talking about? Like one hundred fifty meters. One hundred fifty. Okay. Come on. So two hundred meters. We had Colin, yeah, that, that, uh, that, Colin that. O'Brady on the podcast, and he told us the story of they were trying to ascend, and then they decided not to, and then the Nepalese went up and did it, and how he was like, you know, they should have done it. So it was kind of neat that I've heard that story. Yeah. Also, well, I, I, yeah. I got to know Colin on that expedition actually. Um, so that, so that, yeah, that's where, where we met. So everybody was, was all on that same team that was, um, heading towards the top. It was a tough year. You know, a lot of, a lot of good men were lost that year, unfortunately. Yeah. And then I think he said there was guys that turned around and then they never found them. I mean, he was, yeah, pretty. Yeah. Hats off to anyone that, that puts their, uh, their hat into that arena. Well, guys, I can't thank you enough, uh, for joining us for all the, uh, the listeners and viewers will be around next Friday. Um, and, you know, I'm excited for the future. We've got some changes coming to the Everyday Warrior. Um, let me just say that all boats rise with the tide and um, good things to come. All right, guys, we'll see you next Friday. Thanks, gentlemen.